Chapter 2, The Vanishing Glass Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but private drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose at the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had been had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bobble hats. But Dur Dudley Dursley no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a roundabout at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His aunt Petunia was awake and it was her shrill voice which made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up! Now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She scratched. She screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the cooker. He rolled on his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorbike in it. He had a funny feeling. He had had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon. And don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Daddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off, one of them put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had got a new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery for Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punch bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all, all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's. And Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobby knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of sellotape because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead, which was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could ever remember asking his aunt Petunia was how he had got it. In the car crash, when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. 
Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Darcy's. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. Harry was flying eggs, was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, no much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Margie's present. See, it's here, under, his, under this big one from Mommy and Daddy. All right, thirty-seven then, said Dudley, doing red in, in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon and as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously sent a danger too, because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents, is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, So I'll have thirty. Thirty? Thirty-nine, sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then, Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. At a boy, Dudley, he ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a cine camera, a remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, and video recorder. He was ripping the paper of a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone, looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Fix broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger bars, or the cinema. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mr. Mrs. Fick and a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fick made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry, as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fick had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at TB's Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. He could phone, we could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slog. What about, what's her name, uh, your friend Yvonne? 
On holiday in Mallorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put it hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change, and maybe even have to have a go on Dolly's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she just swallowed a lemon. And come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house. Said Harry. Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo. Said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car is new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried, but he knew. That if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Think you got it, Ams? Don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day. She cried, flinging his her arms around him. I don't want him to come. Dolly yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He should. Harry a nasty grin through the gap in the mother's arms. Just then the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord! They're here," said Aunt Petunia frantically. At and a moment later, Dudley's best friend Pierce Polkis walked in the, in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one. Who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them? Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back with Dursley's in the、uh, of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry's side. I'm burning you. He had said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything," said Harry honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he had made them happen. Once Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barber's, looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut. His hair so short, he was almost bald, except for his fringe, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had loved himself, silly Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already loved, as for his baggy clothes and solitaire glasses. Next morning, however, he had got up to find his hair exactly as it had been before, and Petunia had shredded it off. He had been given a wig in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, and Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old jumper of Dolly's. Brown with orange bubbles. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become. Until finally, it might have fitted a glove puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to this great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd got into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual, when, as so much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys' gad had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress. Telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings, but all he tried to do 
as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the log door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big bins outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that he, the, the wind must have caught him in mid-jump, but today nothing was, was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Fig's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked he liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorbikes. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said as a motorbike overtook them. I had a dream about motorbike said Harry, remembering suddenly, it was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the, the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beetroot with a moustache. Mother buys don't fly! Dolly and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything, acting in a way he shouldn't, no matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon. They seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday, and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a chip lemon ice lolly. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratching its head and looking remarkably like Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he'd had in the long time. He was careful to walk a little way apart from Darcy so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back in their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and then Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory wasn't big enough. Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry laughed, felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. Uh, after lunch, they went to the re re reptile house. It was cool and dark in here, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick, men-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the large snake and the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crashed it into a dustbin. But at the moment, it didn't look in the mode. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He snuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard and a, uh, as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least, he got to visit the rest of the house.
The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes slowly, very slowly. It raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly round to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, when raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I got that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Bow Constructor Brazil. Was it nice there? Bow Constructor jabbed its tail at the sign again, again and Harry read on. This spaceman was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. You've been, you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a defeating shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley, Mr. Dursley, come and look at the snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What can next happen so fast? No one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leaped back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. gasped. The glass front of the bow constrictor's tank was vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and stared running for the exit. As the snake slid stiffly past him, Harry could have sworn a low, hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had, had nearly bitten off his leg, while Pierce was swearing Ed had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at, le at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say Harry was talking to it. Weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before staring at Harry. He was so angry he, he could hardly speak. He managed to say, go cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his, his dark cupboard much later, then, uh, wishing he had a watch. He had no what time it was, and he couldn't be sure. He, the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking to the kitchen for some food. He'd lived with the Dursleys almost ten years, ten miserable years, as long as he could remember. Even since he'd been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash, he couldn't remember being in the car, being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt, aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house.
When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Jerseys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were too. A tiny man in a violet top had had bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dolly. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old man, dressed all in green, had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. The end of the second chapter.